Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSURG, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby we bring you CRAMSURG from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Okay, so um, we've been talking about the steps of evidence-based medicine. So we've done a few uh, uh, sessions on uh, ask and acquire. So the five steps are, as you can see on the screen, there's ask, the right question, acquire the evidence, appraise the evidence, apply the evidence to your practice and evaluate your application of the, of the evidence. So those are the five steps of evidence-based medical practice. Um, we have uh, spent some time talking about ask, asking the right clinical question. Um, we talked about study designs. We talked about foreground and background questions. And we talked about the PICO format. So those YouTube videos are up there. So if you wanted to have a look, we then talked about acquiring the evidence and in acquiring the evidence, I have previously focused on search techniques. How do you search literature, use PubMed database as an example. And we talked about a couple of scenarios in clinical practice, whereby we have generated some questions and searched the literature. So in the next say 10 minutes, uh, we'll talk about types of research databases and the kind of topics they cover, um, primary research versus pre-appraised evidence, the advantages and disadvantages of these. And then I've got a slide on how I go about obtaining full text, but uh, it'll be interesting to hear um, your experiences and comments. So there are lots and lots, of, lots and lots of research databases, as you know, hundreds, but I suspect most people just use one or two. I use PubMed quite a lot. And if you get used to using one database, then you tend to just um, go back to that database um, again and again, as opposed to try out new databases. So some databases are multidisciplinary. It covers a variety of fields, including medicine, physics, chemistry, and you name it. Whereas um, some uh, databases focus just on medicine and biological sciences. And I've just named a few, but there are obviously lots and lots uh, more. With regards to medical research databases, there's a lot of differences between individual databases. And you've got to keep in mind that no single database is actually a comprehensive list of all of the literature on a particular topic. And if you're doing a systematic review, as opposed to just trying to answer a clinical question, you really uh, need to be searching two or three databases. If you do a systematic review and say you've just done the PubMed or Embase, then often the reviewers will come back and say, oh, maybe you've got to look at another database. So you've got some general medical databases like PubMed and Embase, and then you've got some specialist databases. DARE is one, DARE in the Cochrane Library uh, is a uh, uh, database of systematic reviews. And then you've got some databases that focus on specific specialties in medicine. Sometimes you just think, and I've been asked this question, why can't I just Google? Why don't I have a clinical question? I know um, what kind of answer I'm looking for. I'll just use Google, um, a general search engine. It's quick. You can access it easily. You can look for availability of full text. And sometimes you find that there is no paper on PubMed that addresses that particular clinical question, but then you can get a little bit of information on Google about that particular um, question. As long as you understand that uh, with a Google search, there's very limited control on the searches and you can land on to all kinds of websites which provide known research information, which is not peer reviewed, patient uh, information leaflets, um, patient forums, uh, discussion forums, and so on. As long as you're aware of that and don't, don't get too carried away with what you find, 
then that's probably um, not a very bad idea. Right, so uh, we'll, let's talk about primary research and pre-appraised evidence. Now, a lot of people would classify the source of information into two or three categories. I've got three categories here. So when we say primary research, we mean original manuscripts um, where uh, original research has been done. And sometimes it's not a full manuscript, it's just a dissertation. People these days um, tend to publish their thesis online for people to make use of. So that's primary research. Then you've got secondary um, uh, research, which basically refers to, often refers to a systematic review of meta-analysis, sometimes practice guidelines and standards, which often incorporate a systematic search strategy. So these are secondary sources of information. And then there's something called tertiary. Some people use the phrase tertiary um, source of information, which is basically a summary of systematic reviews, books maybe, and also things like the CCA, the Cochrane Clinical Answers, which um, uh, essentially uh, is um, an attempt to answer a clinical question on a topic relating to a Cochrane review. So that could be considered tertiary. So when we say pre-appraised evidence, um, you could argue that anything that is not primary research could be considered as pre-appraised. So uh, you may have come across this pyramid, the Haynes pyramid. There are a number of variations of these um, you will find, but essentially this is a pyramid uh, that gives you some guidance on finding pre-appraised evidence. So as you can see, right at the bottom of the pyramid, you've got um, studies, essentially original articles. And then on top, of, uh, on top of that, you've got systematic reviews, systematic reviews of original articles. And then layer three is systematically derived um, recommendations or guidelines. And layer four is a synthesized summary, which essentially integrates layer one, two, and three. And then finally, you've got systems. Now, I don't really understand much about symptoms, systems, but uh, apparently um, it refers to the process of integrating the evidence from all of these four layers into an electronic patient record or into a computerized decision support system. So I think this is for the future where people are anticipating that you, uh, you use computerized records for everything, and then when you make a diagnosis or you have a certain uh, particular symptom, you can, you are able to, or you are provided with up-to-date uh, evidence on that particular diagnosis um, as part of your electronic health record. So that's probably a future that we, we can, I think we'll have to still um, dream about. It's not here yet. So if you have a clinical question, um, the, the, the next step is, you know, uh, you're searching for evidence and you're thinking, should I use primary research? Should I look up an or original article or should I look up some practice guideline? Now, it really depends partly on the kind of clinical question. And there's this interesting systematic review published about eight years ago, which looked at a number of different studies uh, looking at uh, clinical questions. And they suggested that uh, Clinicians would probably ask one clinical question for every two patients seen, which I thought was quite a large number. And only in half of these for these questions do clinicians actually go and search for the answers. And when they search for the answers, they get the answer they want at three fourths of the time. And of the types of questions, about a third relate to drug treatment, and a significant proportion of the rest relate to either a symptom physical finding or a diagnostic test. In a more recent paper, this is from PLOS One this year, and researchers asked a number of primary care doctors to note down the clinical questions they might encounter as they go through their uh, consultations. And uh, they, they got a list of about 200 valid clinical questions. And of these, 132 are background questions and only 74 were foreground questions. You probably remember the difference between background questions and foreground questions. So of the foreground questions, the questions were on differential diagnosis, diagnostic accuracy, etiology harm, 
prognosis and so on and so forth. Now, I found this uh, quite interesting in that I don't think we'll get similar answers if we survey surgeons. I suspect that we'll be very different to primary care doctors. And um, I can understand why primary care doctors have a lot of background questions. So they might come across a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism or a patient who's probably had treatment for Boerhaave syndrome, and they'd want to know all about that particular disease because they probably wouldn't have encountered a similar patient for a while. But you're not going to have a specialist colorectal surgeon um, who does some specialist pelvic floor clinics to be looking um, for answers to background questions. Does that make sense? Do you um, any comments? Um, yeah, I don't think it makes sense. And I agree, it has to do with your degree of sub subspecialization almost. And presumably also your ability to pinpoint your answer yeah. um, and, and identify a source that's adequate to give you the answer you need. So also the answer sought and answer found statistics would change. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. So, yeah, so the question type is really important. You know, if you're going to, if you have a background question and you think, I really don't know about the syndrome or this disease, then obviously you're not going to look for original articles. You're going to look at a textbook or you're going to look at a review article. Yeah. Or uh, you might just read up a practice guideline from NICE on that particular subject. Now, there are lots of other factors as well, and that will influence whether you're looking for a, an original article or pre-appraised evidence. So speciality, like we talked about, whether you're a primary care person or you're a hospital doctor. Degree of specialization as well. Um, you know, uh, are you a general surgeon or are you a pituitary surgeon or a hand surgeon that doesn't do anything else? And um, you a specialty, are you in a specialty where it's primarily craft based? And um, so you're not really going to be uh, uh, looking for original articles uh, to that much of an extent as somebody else um, who is probably relatively new to that specialty or that particular uh, kind of working. Clinical experience and knowledge also will influence whether you're going to look at primary research or pre-appraised evidence. If you're extremely experienced uh, in that particular area and you work in that area for 20 years, uh, you'll be familiar with the guidelines. So often you'll have questions that uh, relate to rare phenotypes, uh, unusual findings that you've never come across before. And then you'll probably be looking for similar case reports or, or original studies. What about appraisal and methodology understanding? So um, if you are not very confident with clinical, uh, critical appraisal, um, then you probably are not uh, going to be too keen on reading an original paper. You'd rather go with um, what uh, the NICE guidance says on that particular topic. And the final thing is time constraints. Apparently, I didn't know this, there's a 90 second rule apparently, and um, most primary care doctors, if they think they can't get an answer within 90 seconds, they'd say, don't bother looking. Um, maybe refer on to the hospital. So uh, I think there are some advantages in looking at original studies. The advantages are that uh, you, you get to access the original data and then you get to uh, appraise the evidence yourself. And also the big advantage is that it's gonna be uh, fairly recent. You're not gonna uh, find very recent um, data in pre-appraised evidence. The downside is obviously it will be time consuming. Uh, we've appraised a primary research paper today. And sometimes it could be expensive depending on uh, how much access you have to um, published original articles. The advantages of pre-appraised evidence are, one, it saves you a, a lot of time. A single systematic review will summarize data from many different studies. And if you want a very broad answer to a question, like for example, I'll give you an example from my areas. Let's say you want to know about central neck dissection in thyroid cancer, and then you could look up NICE guidance or you could look up a, a systematic review of central neck dissection uh, and you get a lot of information. The downside is if you have a very focused question, 
um, let's say you want to know about whether to do unilateral or bilateral central neck dissection in a specific subtype of thyroid cancer, let's say Hertel cell cancer, then you may not necessarily find an, uh, an answer uh, from pre-appraised evidence. You might want a specific paper addressing a topic because there is unlikely to be many papers on that topic and there's unlikely to be systematic reviews addressing that specific focus question. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, practice guidelines get out of date. They're not often updated. Um, there is something called the living systematic review. There are efforts being made to uh, constantly update practice guidelines, but that's a huge uh, cumbersome task and we, we're not there yet. The final thing to say is that this is process information. So with process information, you lose granularity, and you don't really understand the finer details of, uh, uh, of how the study was done. And uh, also, if you rely too much on practice guidelines and uh, um, evidence that has been processed for you, uh, I think you'll gradually lose critical appraisal techniques that you might have gathered over the years. Finally, access to full text information. So uh, I'd be keen to hear your comments but how do you get full text? So a lot of the full text uh, papers, you know, these days can be accessed via journal websites. There are many journals that have article processing charges. They charge the authors to publish, and then they put them all online for people to access. So for the readers, it's free, but the authors pay uh, um, a lot of money. And then there's some um, websites like PMC, PubMed Central, like ResearchGate, that often provide free access as well, in addition to journal websites. Another um, thing to do is to ask your um, hospital librarian or your university librarian uh, to get some papers. And if it's just a couple of papers, then most of the time they'll, they'll uh, oblige. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a systematic review and need 150 full text manuscripts, then you might have a problem. Um, as a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and the International Surgical Society, um, I get access to full texts of many different journals, surgical journals primarily. Sometimes, on occasion, I have emailed authors. If I find some really interesting paper that I can't get access to, I find the authors, uh, do a bit of Google search on them, get their email ID and send them an email. And very often they'll oblige if you, if you send them a polite email saying you're really interested in that paper. A lot of them, if they have the time and if, it, if they have it to hand, will reply. Another way is uh, in getting manuscripts is to just talk to colleagues in other places. So if you're a university, if in Sheffield you can't get the paper and you have some colleague in London, you will find that um, the, the, the different universities have different subscriptions and you can often get uh, other people to get some interesting article for you. And finally, um, you know, you've probably heard of the Hinari, um, which is a system set up by the World Health Organization, which provides access to full text um, from thousands of journals to um, low-income people in medium and low-income countries. That's it really. So we talked about research databases, very, uh, just a very brief overview. Primary research versus pre-appraised evidence, advantages and disadvantages. And if you've not heard of this before, then you've heard it now, Haynes 5S Pyramid. And we talked about how to access full text. So that kind of concludes our discussion on, on uh, the second step of EVM. So now I think for future talks, we can move on to the third step, which is probably the more interesting, the more meaty step of EVM, which is appraising the evidence. We've already done a few talks on appraising the evidence, but uh, I'll aim to cover um, all of the topics that are mentioned in the core competencies in, in under the category of appraising in future talks. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.